Good evening, and thank you for staying up later. My name's Chris Connolly. Bob Costas is off tonight. Well, asked by the LA Times to describe herself, Meryl Marco once said, just call me a buxom blue-eyed blonde, a leggy blue-eyed blonde, or, or something with the word vixen in it would be nice. Well, the careers that she's considered include uh, stun gun salesman, hypnotist, and professor of drawing at the University of Southern California. Instead, happily, she became a writer, most notably for Late Night with David Letterman, for which she won four Emmys and the gratitude of all Americans for inventing stupid pet tricks. Since leaving the show, she's hosted a number of cable specials and has written a column for the late lamented magazine New York Woman. Her current book is entitled What the Dogs Taught Me. Tonight on Later, the buxom, leggy, blue-eyed, blonde vixen, Meryl Markham. I was thinking of you as I was reading your book the other day because I actually took my first trip to Las Vegas not long ago. Uh, and you, uh, how many excursions? Your very first trip? It, I've never gone before, and it was it was. Uh, well, I've actually only taken one trip myself. Is that right? That was the trip I wrote about in my book. Yeah, I just found it to be totally entertaining, though, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I found it a lot less debauched than I kind of expected. Well, I think there's the debauchery there, but I, what I thought was great was just the wacky Americana. I mean, it's such. A, if you're looking for wacky Americana, you need look no further. I mean, there it is. It's like. I love um, dopey uh, historical recreations, and the Caesar's Palace is just great for that, I think. Did, uh, did you go to Caesar's Palace? No, I didn't. I didn't even see a show. Did you, did you catch one of the shows, like a Wayne Newton or something? Did like I that? ever? I, well, I figured that you want to go to the dopiest show there. I went to Nudes on Ice. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is great because it has like it, 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 they give you a program and it has um, the different plot lines and so forth and the part I liked was called the Russian fantasy where I guess it was that period of Russian history I get this a little foggy where something with the czar or whatever and there was a crop shortage and a lot of the women had to go without clothes <laughs> yeah <laughs> terrible really <laughs> but I, and I learned from that from my experience at the uh at uh, Nudes on Ice, the more breast you expose, the less skating required. Is it, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something true in all walks of life. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> you here? Well, I guess I'll remember that, you know. Yeah. You should, you know, maybe Rockefeller Center could take a little lesson from that downstairs. I think they have. During the Christmas season, yeah. Now, recently, uh, for Vanity Fair, in fact, you, uh, you did one of your occasional experiments in alternate lifestyles, at least as taught by various people. You took a course from a dominatrix? This was a learning annex class, and... Uh, and it was Dominatrix 101 is what it was called. It, was it said, be a dominatrix for fun, love, or profit. And I didn't really know which of those three I was headed <laughs> for exactly. But I, I was like 80 different women turned up at this thing. And it was... Um, 80 women? Yeah, and I didn't know if any of them were there. I, it was hard to tell. I mean, it was really a mixed group of women. It was, it was pretty interesting that way. And um, uh, let's see. Well, it was held at that institution of higher learning, my favorite institution of higher learning, the Hyatt hotel on Sunset Boulevard <laughs> <laughs> in the penthouse and uh, early in it was sort of Q&A with the with the dominatrix who came in and that was kind Thank of... Thank God it was Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an important distinction. I think so, yeah. But the, uh, I guess the highlight of the thing was sort of midway into the class where a, a guy, well a lot of guys were trying to crash the class. It was a women only class. A lot of guys were trying to get get in to take the course or, or no they were just trying to come in fact this this is true a guy before she started the class a guy was hanging around and she said okay this is a women only class but i told this guy he could talk to the class for a minute and he just wanted to give out his business card in case anyone needed someone to practice on true <laughs> <clears throat> that happened a number of times throughout the class it was it was really pretty amazing but the highlight for me was midway she a guy drove up for three hours from san diego a guy who claimed to have been in the navy seals for 30 years 30 years in the Navy SEALs, something the Navy SEALs are going to be really proud of when I tell this story. <laughs> and this guy, first he gets up and he's talking to us about how he wants a detail for us how he was chasing bad guys all over the world. All his stuff that he did with manly danger. He's going on and on about how he detonated weapons and how he jumps out of planes and he goes deep beneath the ocean and all this kind of stuff as a way of building up to the fact that it was that extra measure of stress that causes him to need to wear women's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, I never really fully understood that, quite frankly, because I wear women's underwear, and it isn't making me any less stressed out, let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, so then he took his pants off to show that he had on a garter belt and nylons, which I thought would be a really nice picture for the brochure for the Navy SEAL. So, you think <laughs> so he's sitting there at the front of his class like this, and then we're, the, the dominatrix tells us we're supposed to practice on him, do things to practice on him. So different women are getting up. I myself was just taking notes. I had no practicing. I wanted to you're do. You're auditing. You're, right. You're, That's right. You're trying to place into Dominatrix 201. Yeah. <laughs> I was the auditing. The advanced right. course. Yeah. <laughs> and people are getting up and doing things to him and uh, like pre learning whipping technique. Like I, I did learn an interesting little uh, whipping technique pointer, which is that when you are whipping, you want to head for the shoulders and the back of the legs. You don't want to injure the kidneys. Oh. You don't want to go too. <laughs> And, um, I would think injury was kind of part of the game. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't yeah. you think? Yeah. yeah, injuring the kidneys, or you could probably get paid more. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe you learned that in 201. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, finally, this one woman got up. I thought this was the highlight of the, of the um, trying things on the Navy SEAL section. This woman got up, and she's... Uh, first, the dominatrix put an assortment of kind of stuff around uh, dog collars and whips and so forth. And then this woman said to the guy, uh, get down on your knees and beg like the dog that you are. And this guy did, which I guess because he's worried about his GPA, you know, class. <laughs> I, I was really amazed by it. And then she put a leash on him and she led him around. And that was the point at which I decided to get out of there because I have four dogs. And not one of them was as good on the leash as this guy. Was, <laughs> I put them all through that expensive training. They all pull on the leash. This guy was perfect right off the bat. I was angry. Amazing. I left. <laughs> a bitter woman. You're up to four dogs now? I'm a, I am. Really? Yeah, it was way too many dogs. Way too many. I don't recommend four. Really? Why not? What's wrong with four? It's, I think around three too many. Well, um, <laughs> I, well, just the hair factor alone. At my house right now, it looks like the old prairie. There, I really, I'm not kidding. It's like the, the hair equivalent of tumbleweed is blowing around my house. Just these. It's like a toupee in every corner. <laughs> Do you have one of those dogs who, like, when you come to the door, like, gets all excited? Well, and... my, I have. Well, I have of those dogs that when you come to the <laughs> I don't have people over much anymore. It's kind of a trade-off. Yeah, well, my one dog has a greeting disorder. My one big dog <laughs> <laughs> just isn't happy until he just slams you down. <laughs> you have, obviously, two relatively famous but sadly deceased dogs, right? In, in... Well, but I don't think of having them anymore. Yeah, I have my two dead dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I have my four live dogs, my two dead dogs. How do you, how do you sort of... <laughs> I, I'm kind of curious how you sort of appropriately mourn the passing of a, of a beloved dog. Do you have, like, a shrine to him? Do you have, like, pictures up? Do you, you know, remember him every night? Um, no, I, I don't. I think I appropriately mourned them by replacing them. I guess that's I not very... <laughs> how did your I dog... I don't mean that in a cruel way. I just... I guess that is what I did. I, I mean, I, I liked them so well, I went ahead and got more. Signed up for more. That's nice. That's kind of like a Brady Bunch thing. <laughs> uh, how did your dog stand die, by the way? Oh, my poor dog, Stan. Well, I this know. is, I know this is going to sound funny, and it's really not. He had an overdose of ham. <laughs> it was actually that fancy schmancy kind of ham, too. Well, it wasn't a bit funny at the time, believe mm -hmm. me. I mean, I realized telling people later that it turns out to sound sort of funny. But, but um, uh, I left him with a dog sitter, and, and the dog sitter left a big plate of ham out, and my dog ate like half a ham. And they, it's sort of interesting to know that ham can kill you. It, it killed a 75-pound German Shepherd. I mean, if the wow. fat content stopped his liver, his kidneys, and his uh, pancreas. That's pretty funny, huh? I think. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you're, you're, you're very much associated with sort of late night television and late night television on this and particular... And so are you now. I guess, yeah. You know, on late night television on this particular network. In fact, you appeared on, on uh, Tom Snyder's show, didn't you, at some point? The Tomorrow Program? I did. To... I, I think of that as being who took the wrong turn at the power vortex. I was on Tom Snyder's show with Robin Williams, David Letterman, Billy Crystal, and me it was four rising stand-up comedians. Thank you! Thank you! <laughs> Who didn't rise quite as far as the others? <clears throat> was this before or after you were, or, or during the time where you were, you were involved with David professionally? And... I was already involved with David professionally and otherwise. Mm -hmm. now, it was actually you... a particularly embarrassing show because friends of mine decided it would be really funny to send me a singing telegram that was while full of like double entendres about me and Dave to my dressing room. And then Tom Snyder, having no idea what the content of this singing telegram might be, thought it would be funny to have it on the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was sitting there listening to this just, and it was the first time I'd ever been on TV just melting, just dying. Telegram for Meryl Marco. 
this is a real surprise, yes? I have a singing telegram for you Let's get from it. a couple of your friends, the uh, homo and the hetero. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. You know them. Okay, and these are original <laughs> words for you tonight. Tonight, tonight, won't be just any night. Tonight, we'll see a new rising star. Tonight, tonight, we'll see Marco tonight. And our hearts, they will stop where they are. Today, she's saying things so stupid. But thanks to Mr. Cupid, we know she'll be all right. So just relax and don't plan every word that you'll say. Get her out of here. Congratulations. I guess it's sort of become kind of uh, incorporated into our culture, but at the time, the kind of comedy you were doing, first in the morning show and then, of course, on late night, was different from what was sort of out there in the zeitgeist. How did you, how did you come up with it, and what made it different from the other stuff that was out there? <clears throat> well, this becomes a little more difficult because I can't remember how it was that different from what was out there. It was coming out of my head and out of Dave's head, so it was... Uh, was uh, all of the things that we thought were interesting and original. I, w I was really anxious by the time we hit the night show. The morning show, the rules were a little different. We were just uh, struggling to survive and be original then. By the night show, the, the um, dramatic issue seemed to be, for me, um, thinking of things that didn't remind me of The Tonight Show. We were following The Tonight Show, and it used to be the way that late night programming was that um, the Tonight Show would succeed itself. You know, there, there was Jack Parr, then there was Johnny Carson, and then someone would take over there. But now we, there was something following The Tonight Show that was sort of not unlike in format, going to have guests and so... Well, The t Tomorrow Show used to be on, but it didn't used to be the same kind of right, format yeah. with a desk and, a, and wacky stuff. So I, w I, was, I always found The Tonight Show, now I'll reveal something horrible here, but I always found the original Tonight Show to be, although everyone else thinks of it as legendary and incredible, I thought it was incredibly boring. I never liked it. And so I was looking for things that um, were more exciting and interesting in every way that you could do with a cast of one, the one being Dave. So I was adapting a lot of uh, editorial eye kind of stuff to the writing of it. And, and, and then using all the things that you could use as elements, you know, go out into the hall. I mean, there, was, there were certain restrictions, enormous restrictions. But then all The Tonight Show was doing was pretty much that single shot and a double shot, have the guests on, and then they had Stump the Band. and. So there was a lot of stuff they weren't doing. So that was pretty much the, the rules as I saw them, is think of other things besides Stump the Band. Was it your natural love of dogs that enabled you to come up with the idea for Stupid Petrix? It was uh, my natural love of dogs, and at the time, my natural love of Dave, and knowing that we needed many, many, many things on the show that you had to do <laughs> over and over and over. And so I was looking for things that, uh, would, that you could do over and over again. And it occurred to me at some point when I was thinking of those things that I had, that everyone I knew at some point had brought their animal out for me and shown me the one thing that, like I was thinking at that particular moment of, of one evening where two people I knew had entertained us for the evening by putting socks on their Great Dane. <laughs> and I just thought, everybody does that. Everyone puts socks on the Great Dane. Why don't we have the Great Dane on the show? And then that was that. Did it stun you, the response that sort of stuff got? Did you expect that it would? I, uh... I expected it, because I, I well, because I just find animals endlessly funny, and I assumed that there was... But you try a thing... I mean, I always assume a lot of things that don't work, too. So it was the fact that we ran an ad and we got a lot of response, then it kind of... Anything you get a lot of response to when you're filling up a five... It's like writing a newspaper doing a five-day-a-week thing. Every day, there's all the same amount of time left. So you have to keep thinking of... If you don't have things you can repeat, you're starting all over again from scratch every single day. So something that, that you can do more than once is the, is the bread and butter of the whole thing. Did you used to, like, go through the yellow pages to find places to go and things like well, that? Well, I used to do... I used to be in charge of a lot of the remotes on late night for the many years that I was working there. And when I say a lot, I mean, I guess all of the remotes at some point. And, yeah, I was... That, that was what I was doing. I was just going through the yellow pages. Because <laughs> I figured that... Pretty much everything on the Yellow Pages hadn't been on TV yet. So, <laughs> and still is the case. I don't think it's been on TV since. I guess that's probably true. Of course, you've done remotes with great success. I, uh, one, one famous one, I guess, is the Mickey Rooney yogurt. Uh, well, it's not particularly famous, but, but it it's was about to be. famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked in, when I left late night, I worked in local news in Los Angeles for a couple of years. I was doing the uh, not particularly highly rated Merrill's L.A. There was even more excitement than usual in Thousand Oaks today, 
when a brand new frozen yogurt store opened its doors. And not just anybody's frozen yogurt store. I was the only person to go out and cover Mickey Rooney was opening a yogurt parlor. You know, he used to, when I lived here in New York, he had the Weenie World, and he had the, uh, he's always had these weird businesses that I've always found fairly amusing. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was pleased to be able to go cover his yogurt parlor opening, and I was the only press that was there, <laughs> oddly enough. Not so oddly after all, but they had a ribbon cutting ceremony, and they had um, a high school band was playing and stuff. And then I got on Mickey Rooney's nerves really quickly, and, and you know, God bless this station I was working for. They aired the darn thing. Mickey Rooney was yelling at me, kind of. <laughs> he was sort of threatening me, actually. <laughs> they put in, I found it fairly funny when I watched it later. What are we looking forward to for festivities here? Here? Oh, we're going to have a few strippers. Oh, really? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, of course not. Well, we've got one of the most wonderful bands in the world. We've yeah. got with Thousand Oaks high school band yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey don't you make fun of me i'm bigger than you are <laughs> don't ever do that because you'll never know what's behind a book cover honey don't uh -oh. ever do that uh-oh uh-oh no, i uh -oh, love you too much. Uh -oh. oh boy too much. i'm glad <laughs> yeah in the press now obviously with all these late night things going on as to why there aren't more women so you're saying there are a lot of late night things going on now. apparently yes from <laughs> 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 you know, you pick up the times every now and then, apparently. Yeah, there's... I don't know. I sort of, I haven't heard about that yet. So there's more shows coming on, apparently? Yeah, yeah. That's what I understand, yeah. Uh, why aren't there more women involved as writers, as well, people So you're saying there are no women involved in <laughs> <laughs> Really? Huh. So there, what, there are, like, how many are involved? None? No, apparently none. Virtually none, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> why would that be, do you think? <laughs> Beats the heck out of me. <laughs> Sure, there's none. There's no women involved. Virtually none. Isn't that wow? Is it, what is what it are a, the chances of that happening? Almost none. Yeah. Is there is there a sensibility thing about late night? Because obviously women are heavily involved in. Where, sitcoms. Well, 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 yeah, you thinking it's fifty percent of the population? When you think there'd be like some women involved? Jeez, no. How could that happen? Well, did you hire? <laughs> 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 did you hire women when you were a head writer here? Uh, when I was right. When I was no. As a matter of fact, I didn't. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. <laughs> well, you know, the weird thing was, when I, when I was uh, write, head writing for Dave and not hiring any women my very own self, the task, really oddly enough, in a, a show like that is, is um, a lot of people being Dave's alter ego. And at right. the time, <clears throat> he says no to most material that people submit, so you really have to load the gun with a lot of bullets that you think are going to fire. And the material that I read, there was not much submitted by women, and the material that I read... Uh, by the few women who submitted didn't seem to particularly match the sensibility of Dave, which was, it wasn't really, it's not a creative open forum to write for Dave. It's about giving Dave the kind of, the real fact of a show like Dave's show is if Dave could, he would write it all himself. He used to write, these guys used to be stand-ups and they, and they used to write all their material themselves and everybody has to be their alter ego. Now I, myself, was a pretty good alter ego for him because I had given grisly new depth to the term codependent. <laughs> 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 by living with him and writing for him. So, uh, so I, I kind of had that down, and I was, I, but I was picking other people who reminded me of his sensibility. Now, on the other hand, if I myself had a late night show, I think I would hire probably all women to write. Not, of course, I would hire you. Well, and you I, know, I'm not I, all, but uh, um, I'm not all woman, but there's no. some, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, it's a question of, of uh, uh, matching a sensibility. I mean, how it comes to be that there are no women in late night, I don't know. How hard was it for you to leave late night? Well, it wasn't particularly hard. <laughs> <laughs> why, did, why did you want to do it? Well, I was, uh, Dave and I were living together, as you, as you know, and when a relationship breaks up, really often you don't care to work with a person anymore. <laughs> 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 but you know the good news is it's really it's there's nothing really uncomfortable at all about seeing him on TV day and night. <laughs> That's not a Fellini problem. <laughs> my life just seems like Fellini to me. Like constantly see your old boyfriend, not just showing up on TV unexpectedly all the time and in the press and everywhere and every cover of everything, but really looking good. It's like a good showcase, you know, looking good, nice lighting, saying something clever, doing the best, cutest thing he ever could do. You'd sort of yes, prefer like a will work for food sign or something. Right? <laughs> the yeah, uh, least. <laughs> like an exit, you know? That yeah, kind of thing. your old boyfriend's going to show up. They shouldn't have good lighting. <laughs> <laughs> did you consider going on the show when the book came out? Did you, you know, did you 
think about going on late oh, night? Aren't you being probing now? Well, you know, <laughs> you know, we're coming in real tight now. They're doing one of those like current affair push ins, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, they wouldn't book me. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I did. I, I, I actually I thought I was going to go on the, uh, the show when the book came out in hardcover because they invited me, but then they got mad that I went on Arsenio and, uh, and The Tonight Show. But I had a little, I had sort of a fun thing that I was going to do, which I'll share with you now because, uh, because apparently I'm not going to do it. I was saving his mail because his mail, some of his mail still comes to the house. I was saving a big pile of his mail, and then I was going to come out and sit down and say, <clears throat> um, Ex please excuse me if, if I'm uh, off here or anything, but have you not been home in really a long time? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would have been funny. Thanks for talking to us. It was a lot of Thank fun. Thank you for talking to me. Hey, and, and uh, we followed, I guess, your first late night ever, the first late night with David Letterman ever, ever done. Do you remember how tense you were that day? Was it... Uh, yeah, I remember just a vein in my head throbbing is what I think you remember. <laughs> Well, you, it was you really nerve-wracking, actually. It was extremely nerve-wracking. Was, it was like a gun-to-the-head kind of a situation. We felt that, even though we, we were on for a period of time, well, Dave always felt every minute that I worked with him that we were going to get canceled, and we didn't think the first show would be the day we wanted to get canceled, particularly. <laughs> so we were hoping for that one to go okay. Well, congratulations, having made it this far. Um, for what? <laughs> we'll figure that out eventually. And thank you for staying up later with us. I'm Chris Conley. Bob Costas comes back next week. We'll see you again on Later.